Did you know that one of the biggest fears that people have is the fear of public speaking? Most people would rather do anything than to do some public speaking. That's just un so unfortunate because good leaders need to have that skill. They need that tool in their toolbox. So today I thought I would talk to you a little bit about public speaking and hopefully answer some questions if you have some at the end. So good leaders need good public speaking. And a quote that I found off the Toastmasters website is, people with good communication skills are more likely to be promoted to leadership positions and good leaders need communication skills to be effective. If you think about President Haas, he always opens the fall season with um, a faculty staff address and then he follows that immediately with an address to the students for convocation. So he does public speaking many, many times throughout the year. I'm just using that as one example. So what kind of forms of communication are there? I just put three down for you to think about. There's the written, the oral, and the nonverbal. Written, we love books, especially when they keep us interested, right? There are fiction, nonfiction, there's poetry, all <coughs> kinds of books. And we like what I like to think of it as a speech is something like a good book, something that will keep you interested. So a good book equals a good speech in a way. Then there's um, oral. We're going to talk a little bit more about oral speaking today, but we're going to breeze over that for right now. And we're going to go to nonverbal. Nonverbal. How many of you remember your parents? They didn't even have to say anything. They just gave you that look. And you knew. One more moment of pushing it, and you're going to be in trouble. So there's the nonverbal communication. And that's a skill, too. But today we're going to talk about the oral. Now there's many types of speeches. There are prepared speeches, impromptu, an elevator speech, and a panel discussion. I put those down as examples of speeches. Today we're going to talk a little bit about the prepared speech. Prepared speech could be a toast. I remember when my parents had their 50th anniversary and about 30 seconds before I had to speak, they came to me and they said, hey, how would you like to give a toast? Mm -hmm. And there were about 200 people in the room, and it gave me like that much time to think about what I was going to say. Everybody liked what I said, so I guess it worked <laughs> out just fine. But there are opportunities that you're going to come across in your whole life where you'll have chances to speak. You might not even know that right now, but how did I know I was going to give a toast at my parents' 50th? I didn't. People will be asked to give eulogies, People will be asked to give, um, accept an award, maybe, if they're, if they're accepting one, or give an award. Or there's also um, times when you might be asked to give a farewell speech to a co for a co-worker who's retiring. I know of an instance where that happened a couple years ago, and the, the co-worker said to her boss, I would really like to give a little, say a little something about this woman who's retiring. Would you mind when we, at the party, and the boss said, sure, that would be fine. So she gave a really nice presentation. The next day, the worker said to her boss, that was really, really fun. And I really liked that. And I thought about her job a little bit more, and I wondered if I might be able to apply for it. She said, sure. I can see you got great leadership skills. You did a wonderful job presenting yesterday. Go ahead and apply for it. She got the job. And she's, this is her, speech, her story, and she said it's okay to share it. But she said now, over the course of the next 10 years, she figured her income was $100,000 greater than it would not, have been, would have been, would not have been if she wouldn't have given that speech. So you never, ever know. It's nice to have that skill in your toolbox. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about impromptu speeches. Impromptu speeches <coughs> are extemporaneous. And in Toastmasters, we call them table topics. Table topic speeches are one to two minutes long. And it just, it's, it's a short speech, but it definitely has some structure to it. And we'll talk about that in just a little bit as we go along here. But then there's the elevator speech. An elevator speech is a one minute speech that you will want to have prepared so that if you, you come across somebody and they say, so tell me about yourself, you don't stumble through. You know you've got that prepared ahead of time. You know what you're going to say. So that's an elevator speech. You might want to think about that. And then a panel discussion is 
just what it is, a panel discussion. There might be some times when you'll sit on a panel of experts with others, and it's sort of like a prepared speech because you know the entire topic, but it's also like an impromptu speech because you don't know what the question will be. So you'll have a one to two minute answer for the, the question that somebody will give you. So it's like a little impromptu speech. So those are some examples of types of speeches. There are lots of different speeches, but those are just some examples. Now the components of a speech, you've got your beginning, your middle, and your end. Just like a great story has your beginning, middle, and end. Your beginning, you want to start with something that will hook them, whether it be a statistic. Like I said, most people would rather, <coughs> that's a big fear of theirs for public speaking, that was a hook. So you want to hook them in somehow with either a dramatic statement, some sort of a statistic, a joke, a little short story, something that will grab their attention and keep them. And then you'll have the body of the speech prepared. Generally it works where you've got three main points. And you can tell them what the three main points are if you want, and then tell them, again, what they are. Go through, you know, the first point is going to be about what we'll say, okay, this speech is going to have three parts to it, and we're going to talk about rainbows. And the first, whatever, I'm just <laughs> making that up as I go along, but whatever it is. And they talk about speech, you know, the first rainbow was blah, blah, blah. The second rainbow and the third rainbow, and then tie it all together at the end with your conclusion. It's really important to tie the end to the beginning and the middle so that it all makes sense. Otherwise, the audience won't really know when the speech ends. They won't know that. And they also will be a little bit confused about the whole thing. What, when is it going to end? How did that tie together with what they started with? So those are some, some components of a speech. Now, what makes a speech successful? The first thing is to practice. Just like any other skill that you have, the more you practice it, the better you'll be. Whether it's practicing that particular speech for that day, or you practice public speaking altogether, the more times you give speeches, the better off you'll, you'll do. So practice. And smile. How about if you smile? That may, makes the audience feel good. Gestures. You want to use hand gestures. Sometimes when you're standing up and you're first learning to speak, you don't know what to do with your hands. You feel like, what do I do? So sometimes you see people, they're just, just kind of holding them down. They're, they've got them in front of them. They're clicking a pen. They're just doing all kinds of funky stuff, and they don't really know what to do. So you have to learn how to just use your hands and do some gestures. If you're going to talk about something that's quite large, you can put your hands up. If you really don't have anything to gesture about, it's okay to have them down. Just relax and have your hands down. It's fine. If you use some research and quotes like Gleaves loves to do, and I really appreciate that, and Brian, you do that too. You'll bring in stuff, <coughs> research, and some quotes and statistics from other areas that helps make your speech more credible. So that helps a lot. I like that a lot. I like to learn from a speech, no matter what it, kind of a speech it is. I love to learn something, go away with something. So, and then we've got some vocal variety. How many of you have sat through a speech that is so boring because they are so monotone? It's just constant. And, you know, you're looking at your watch and come on. Well, we don't like that. So just have some vocal variety in your speech. A good way to practice that is by storytelling. Even if you're telling a story to a little, a little kid or a kindergarten group or... You can tell it to anybody, but then that gives you some practice telling stories because you can use things like, and then my mother yelled, get over here! And you can practice your vocal variety that way. It helps a lot. And eye contact. When you're talking to an audience, don't just scan the audience like this, because that doesn't really help. Just concentrate, like Marlene, I'll just look at you for a minute and draw you in and then move over to you, Petra, and, and like that. And just keep talking while you're practicing and giving your speech and that will draw the audience into you. It will, make, it will make them more interested in the speech as well. And use concise words. There are times when you'll hear a speaker ramble on and you think, get to the point. We've all had that. 
if you use concise words, try to make word pictures out of your story, out of your speech. It will make it more vibrant as well. And don't use jargon if you're not talking to a certain group of people. You've got to remember who your audience is so that you don't speak about things they don't know what you're talking about. And visualize yourself succeeding. That's really, really important to just tell yourself you will succeed. Your audience wants you to succeed. They don't want you up there and fail. They want to help you and help you succeed. So those are some of the things. Um, and one other thing that you can try to remember is don't use filler words. Um, uh, you know, so those are filler words that don't have any meaning whatsoever. It's really hard not to do that. It's really easy to try to transition to another sentence or another topic by saying, and so, and then going on to the next. And that just doesn't need to be there. So the more you speak, the more you'll hear those things in yourself and in others. Try to remember that. How do you relate to your audience? It's really, really important to relate to your audience. <coughs> know who they are if you can. Know their interests. Try to connect with them in some way, shape, or form. Keep their interests in your mind because they're there because they want to be there. And try to help them get something out of it so that when they walk out of the room, they're glad they were there. Remember, you can ask yourself, they will ask themselves, who cares? What's in it for me? Those are some things that the audience will ask themselves. Who cares? What's in it for me? So you need to make it interesting for them. This isn't about the speaker, it's about the audience when you give a speech. Add something to your talk, if you'd like, that ties into them. You've seen a, you've probably seen this on Comedy Central where a comedian will say, oh yeah, I was taking the train to the, to the Broadway whatever play today and I noticed that there's a lot of traffic around here. How do you guys get through all this traffic? Or whatever. They just try to connect with their audience in some way. And, the, and one of the last things is to be prepared. Come early if you can. Familiarize yourself with the room. Today was a little <laughs> bit different. Today was different. So we, I familiarized myself with the room when I got here. Sure did. Know where the doors are. Know, know where the audience is going to be coming in and out. Know where the doors are. I know where that door is. This is not going well. Yeah. <laughs> we are bored. <laughs> if you see people bolting to the door, you know you've got to spice it up a little bit. <laughs> no, but too, if, if people are coming in and out, you'd like to know where are the doors? Why are they leaving? When are they, you know, what's going on here? Just familiarize yourself with the lighting, the doors, the the equipment, if nothing else, the equipment, because I have seen it happen time and time again where the equipment fails. Have you seen that? The teacher's going to give a PowerPoint. What? <laughs> this is why I don't ever use it. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's you brought your own megaphone. Yeah. <laughs> I was at a Toastmaster conference two weeks two weeks ago, and the the speaker was Ed Tate. I don't know if you've ever heard of Ed Tate. But he is the 2000 year, the year 2000, he won the public speaking championship in the world. So he's a world renowned speaker. It was dinner, which is the, right after dinner, which is the hardest time to give a speech because everybody's full, everybody's tired, and they don't really want to pay attention. <laughs> so he was up there giving his speech, gave us a little exercise to do. And the next thing you know, his PowerPoint failed him. Sure enough, it did. So he had us do another exercise while, we were, while he was fiddling with his laptop. And luckily, it was about the end of his, um, his speech because he couldn't revive it at all. He wound up giving us a website to go to, and we could download for free his $100 information he was selling as a little token because he felt terrible. <laughs> Well, that happened. A couple of days ago, somebody was telling me that their, they, that their class, their graduate class, went over to listen to a speaker, and the professor didn't realize that the speaker was going to take the entire time. Turned out, 
the, the students were pretty upset because they couldn't get from the instructor what they needed for their final paper that's due. So she had to wind up extending the deadline for that paper for another week because she couldn't give that because the speaker went over. So that's, that wasn't very good either. So if you're going to use PowerPoint, <coughs> be sure and have because if the PowerPoint fails you, then you have the handouts. Perfect example <laughs> today. <laughs> and you can always just give yourself a, a PowerPoint handout if you want. If you've got a great big group of people, then you don't have to make them for everybody. Just make one for yourself so that you at least have your own notes. Another thing that I wanted to mention is when I'm going along here, normally I would be behind some sort of a lectern or something, and you wouldn't see that I'm flipping these notes back and forth, but your own notes don't staple them. Just slide them like this when you're done with that page. Just gently slide it over to the next. You can go right on. That's just another little tip. And ending your speech. Watch your time. If you're given a certain amount of time, don't go over. Because the audience has that in their mind, too. They know this is going to be 30 minutes, and then I'm going to be out of here. They don't want to go 35, 45, 55 minutes. Well, they, they're thinking to themselves, I've got other things to do. Wrap it up, would you? <laughs> so that's just the truth of the matter. People are busy. So tie your speech together. And when you're finished, the audience will know it. They will know. I just wanted to share with you a few observations about meetings. Meetings make people glaze over, just the idea <laughs> of having a meeting. People usually don't get much energy from meetings. But if you learn to take... I say the word <laughs> Pavlov's dog over here, he's going to glaze over. <laughs> If, if you learn to use meetings as a, a really dynamic opportunity, you'll, you'll be amazed at what can happen. As an historian, the first thing I want to point out to you is that meetings have changed the world. Think about it. The Council of Nicaea, for example, is what determines what Christianity is going to look like. You have three centuries of all these little bands, these little groups fighting over what Christianity is. There was no such thing as orthodoxy in those first three centuries because every local group had its own version of Christianity. Um, the idea that we have that <clears throat> there was this body of orthodoxy from the very beginning and oh, there was the little heretic there. There was the person who wasn't conforming over there, the reprobate. Mm -mm. It was a dynamic situation from the very beginning. And so when those bishops come together at the Council of Nicaea, they had a plan, they had prepared, they knew exactly what the opposition were going to say from the get-go, and they were able to set the terms of the debate, and they used that meeting as an opportunity to define Christianity and to change the world. We are the children of the Council of Nicaea, those of us who have grown up in a Christian home or had uh, Christian influence in our lives. It was a meeting that set the terms of what the faith would look like. Um, if you look at uh, some, some other uh, famous meetings, I always go back to, say, the Second Continental Congress, when our country was really at its wit's end with how to deal with the king and parliament across the big pond. We had tried the Olive Branch Petition. We tried every which way to say to the king, we want to be good, loyal British subjects. We are humbly petitioning you as loyal, loyal subjects. We're petitioning our sovereign. We want to stay in. But there are things that are intolerable. And when, of course, the Americans were met with arrogance and dismissal, uh, we decided on a revolution, and it's the Second Continental Congress that brings together uh, people from, of course, the 13 colonies, and the Declaration of Independence is created. Yes, it is a committee written and approved document to a great extent. Thomas Jefferson is a member of a committee of five with Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston and Benjamin Franklin and John Adams. Adams defers, he says, young Jefferson's the best writer. But believe you me, they're all looking over his shoulder as he comes in with his draft. And if you look at that draft of the Declaration of Independence that he creates, you see a lot of, of change that's, that's brought about by the committee. So it, it's a co combination of Jefferson's genius, to be sure, but with that committee of five 
and the larger Second Continental Congress, a meeting which determines, in essence, the shape, the brilliance of the most <coughs> famous political statement ever penned. Then you look at the Continental, uh, the Constitutional Convention of 1787. Uh, James Madison comes in with a plan, just like these bishops at the Council of Nicaea that I mentioned earlier. Madison comes in and he's determined to scrap the Articles of Confederation because the American Republic or republics are not working in international commerce, trying to, to raise an army, to pay for an army, to defend ourselves. Do you have 13 different states creating their own separate commercial treaties with other countries, or are we going to have a unified front? James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, George Washington, they saw the problem. Madison came up with a plan. He absented himself from his regular life, his duties for six months. He studied constitutions, became a constitutional scholar in that time. And then he devised what was needed at that meeting of 50-some-odd people who would come together in Philadelphia starting in May 1787, a meeting that would last in secrecy with windows bolted, nailed shut until September 17, 1787. And because Madison came prepared and knew what he wanted to achieve at the meeting, just like those bishops, you know, in the 300s, he was able to get a lot of his ideas into the document that you know as the Constitution. Again, because he prepared and had a plan before the meeting. And he saw the meeting not just as something that we glaze over about, not just something that's going to, you know, take the romantic genius, you know, and shove him aside because now he's got to deal with all these other people. He said, no, it's going to become a persuasive act. I'm going to get into this meeting. I've got this agenda. I've got to be smart about presenting my agenda, and I'm going to persuade and I'm going to keep persuading, and I'm going to have setbacks, but I'm going to keep getting up every morning and go at it. Preparation. Knowing your stuff. Really having the substance that you're trying to master locked there in your cranium so when you get together with other people, you know how to present your case. And you know you have those political skills, that emotional intelligence, the people skills, to know when to step back and let the other big egos in the room roar and rage and rant, as they will, if they're losing the debate. But then knowing when to come back, when to have you know, the, the Madeira, the port, when to go see George Washington, you know, when to go to the tavern and say, oh, you know, I've got a potential ally there. And then come to the next meeting having, what's the word I'm using again and again? Prepared. Mm -hmm. You know what's in your head, you come prepared. Think about some of the ways we prepare for meetings. Meetings are not just meeting. How do you come into a meeting? Do you dress as your boss dresses? Do you come into a meeting and... See, you can't stay seated. <laughs> you stay seated. I couldn't either. But do you come into a meeting with appropriate demeanor, and if you're not the boss, you know, come in and, and good eye contact with the boss, but do you send a signal to your colleagues that were something to happen, you know, you would be prepared through your demeanor, the clothing you had chosen to wear, the words you choose to use, you would be prepared to lead at a moment's notice. You see, every meeting is an opportunity for you to build the confidence of those around you in you. That's preparation. Preparation. It's the same thing Kelly was talking about in public speaking. And talk about public speaking, the reason I love this dovetailing we've got going here is that these impromptu moments that you'll have in a meeting. It's like chess. Benjamin Franklin said, meetings are like chess. Somebody makes a move. And until the big guy slams the gavel down and says it's over, it ain't over. Do you go in, have you prepared and you thought, okay, we're going to have this meeting today. I think Douglas is going to support me. He's a good guy. He and I get along. We've had a couple of, we've had our port in the tavern, we've had our Madeira in the tavern. <laughs> I know what he thinks. Allison, on the other hand, <laughs> she's, she's going to be a tough nut to crack here. She's going to be resistant because she has got a very fine mind. I'm not saying yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> and she does not like going out drinking with the rest of us. Uh, she's, she's an independent thinker, and she's got her own little group over there. So somehow, ah, 
but I know somebody who gets along with Allison very well that I also get along with Petra over here. Petra. <laughs> I, I make an opportunity to talk to Petra and say, you know, Petra, I think we've got some really good ideas bubbling up here. Petra, you darn right we do. Mm -hmm. Petra's on board. Petra, we've got a couple people that I think are going to be resistant to these. Who do you think? And I let Petra kind of figure out what I'm thinking by asking her. I don't just impose it on her. But all of this is groundwork. All of this is preparation. And Petra's going along and say, yeah, we've got Douglas, we've got Brian. We've got... Allison, I'm not sure Allison's going to think about this. Well, Petra, you have a great relationship with, like, before our meeting, before our meeting, could you kind of give her the heads up? If she hears it from me, she said, there's going to be a wall. We don't have good emotional mojo. You do. See what can happen. And if that doesn't work, <clears throat> Petra, if... If Allison is going to continue to resist, is there a little bit of horse trading we can do here? If she will give in a little bit in this meeting and say, okay, Whitney, you get this, can I offer her something to get her to, to be flexible there? But all of this takes place behind the scenes before the meeting. The meeting is a lifetime, real-time performance where you've got to make sure in this finite amount of time you achieve the objective you're trying to achieve. Now, not all meetings are about changing the world, obviously. Right. <laughs> I mean, a lot of meetings are informational. We just have to, to make sure that information is conveyed in a logical, clear way. A lot of meetings are to clarify objectives and to make sure that if we want you to do something after the meeting, you have the tools to do it and a clear objective about what you're doing while you're doing it and are fired up. Uh, Aristotle, and this is where your presentation and mine overlap, Aristotle said, we, basically when we communicate, we're, we're trying to persuade. And we persuade through three means. We persuade through our character, our ethos, who we are, our reputation. Um, when I talk about Kelly's vast experience in Toastmasters, she already has a bachelor's degree. She's working on a master's degree. She works in the president's office. All of those are the introducer's burden to make sure that Kelly has a good platform then to continue the persuasive process. But I began persuading you that she's worth listening to in the introduction. That's the burden of the introducer. So sometimes we're persuading through ethos and credibility, reputation. Other times we're, we're persuading through logic, reason, the information that we persuade, we make a case. So maybe that's the, the purpose of the meeting, is to emphasize not how good a, a, a guy, the person leading the meeting is, but how important the topic is and to get you to see the topic in a certain way. And the third and most powerful way of persuading that Aristotle talks, talks about is pathos. Our word pathetic comes from it, but it's, it's, it's using the emotional appeal that can be so strong to get people to say, you know, it's Martin Luther King saying, you know, I have a dream. And I want you to understand that dream. And to build that crescendo and with that eye contact and that immediacy and the, the nonverbal signals that you're sending along with great control over your voice. Every meeting has the opportunity to exercise this Aristotelian insight into how we persuade. But you just have to prepare, you have to have the substance, and you have to know what you're about. Sometimes your appearance at a meeting is going to be a support role. So when Edmund Randolph goes along with Jimmy Madison to the, sec to the, uh, the Constitutional Convention, it's very much to support Madison. And then you, you know, you're the good lieutenant there, and you give a lot of strong eye contact. You know, people in a room, will, their eyes will go where your eyes go. So if all of a sudden we start staring at you, I mean, if I start staring at you, <laughs> yeah. they're all going to say, what is he saying? <laughs> but I mean, that's how it happens. Mm -hmm. And so Edmund Randolph's role there is to sit in a strategic place where he can look at Madison. Every time Madison talks, and we have notes from the Constitutional Convention, every time Madison talks, Randolph is there. And there's a very important role for that at the meeting, too. And it's, again, you have prepared for that. You know what your role is. And how do we support people at a meeting? It's very important to, to send a lot of nonverbal signals because you won't have the floor. You give them eye contact. You make sure that your eyes are on them. 
it doesn't hurt to nod. When they're making a strong point, you know, not an agreement. This is something Rusty Hills taught me in the governor's office. Rusty would get everybody together and he would say, okay, the governor is going to say this line at this point, and governor, I want you to punch it. But if you don't punch it, and people aren't picking up that it's an important line, I will lead the applause. Rusty knew how to be a good lieutenant and do that. And as soon as Rusty applauded, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, everybody, now whoever was at the meeting or whatever the purpose was, would applaud. So the nonverbals that we send in any form of communication as listeners and as followers are also important. At most meetings, you will be listeners and followers. But understand the importance of that, and I'll tell you why. If the person who's leading the meeting, leading the charge, leading the ideas, they're taking you, your organization of the future, you want to be sensitive to those nonverbal cues. What are you presenting to that person? Are you giving them good eye contact? In our society, now this is not in many Asian cultures, but in our society, uh, eye contact is very important for listeners and followers. The lack of eye contact among listeners and followers is often seen as a sign of disrespect. Now, you have to give people freedom, obviously, to, I think I'm going to think about this a minute. You know, that sort of thing. It's not always a sign of disrespect, but, but you want to support, if, if you've prepared and you know your role at the meeting, again, preparation, you know your role at the meeting, and you know whether you're a good lieutenant who's going to support, as I was exclusively for 12 years of my life, exclusively, I played a support role. Very rarely, very rarely. Um, I mean, ultimately, even if I prevailed on a particular debate, ultimately it was incorporated into the larger purposes of the governor's goals. And so, again, support, support, support. Um, so, you know, you will make a huge impression at meetings, if you come prepared, if you've talked to the, the people who are in, important in the dynamics of a meeting, if you know, if you're in a support role, what you can say to support, indeed, if you do have an opportunity to lead on a particular point, how you're going to do it, what alliances, what trust have you built up prior to it, and then once you get in there, are you going to use ethos, logos, pathos, actually to do the persuading? Is some going, somebody going to help you by introducing you? Because maybe half the people at the meeting don't really know who you are yet. You don't want the burden of having to introduce yourself because you, you never want to be stuck with holding up your own ethos. Mm -hmm. Exactly. You know, I'd have Marlene, for example, introduce me and say, well, you know, in this new group, Marlene knows me, and so she would, she would say who I am, give me a little bit of background. When unless, you came to my class the other day. Yeah. Unless the seminar is named for you, then you've already <laughs> 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 That's right. That's right. So, <laughs> let me give you just a couple more anecdotes about how this works in practice. Um, and you will see that preparation is key. After the Battle of the Bulge started, I, th I think of Battle of the Bulge because it was just this time of year in 1944. It's leading up to Christmas, and the Germans wanted to to create one final, last gasp, desperate offensive to discourage the Allies who had gotten this this foothold in Fortress Europe that the Germans had created. They turned the continent into Fortress Europe, where the German Wehrmacht was in control. And the Allies, with Ralph Hallenstein, part of that advance, were moving toward Berlin. They had not reached the Rhine yet. The Germans saw the writing on the wall. If the Allies kept pushing, if, every, if the status quo prevailed, the Allies would get to the Rhine, and then after that, the Allies would be in German territory, and the war would be lost. So the Germans create this massive offensive that no one anticipated. No one believed that they could do. It's called the Battle of the Bulge, and the reason it's called the Battle of the Bulge is that on the map of the, the Western Front, there was a huge bulge where the, the German offensive literally pushed back all the Allies, the French, the Belgians, the Americans, the Canadians, the Aussies, and so forth. <clears throat> After Eisenhower, who was, if you've read Ralph's book, in charge of the Allied defense 
toward Berlin and retaking Europe. After Eisenhower perceived exactly what was going on, he called together his top generals. Names, if you've watched the movie Patton, you know these names. Bradley, Patton, Montgomery's part of this. Eisenhower needed to know how to try to defeat the Germans as quickly as possible, so he needed a smart plan. But the first meeting Eisenhower called unfolded in the way a lot of meetings do. Let's just sort of sit down, wring our hands for a few minutes, and brainstorm. Well, George Patton was a very aggressive and smart general. He had done splendidly all through his Army career in all of his training exercises. He was like the A-plus student, but he was a bit of a nonconformist because he was, he was a bit of a wild card because of his aggressive personality. George Patton saw that he had an opportunity to go in with a plan. He correctly anticipated that the first meeting over what to do about the German advance and this, creating this bulge in the map was going to be a lot of hand-wringing. Gosh, you know, we can't get supplies over here. We can't do this. It's going to be a lot of can't, can't do it. And that's not the kind of person Patton was. So he's going to go into a meeting of his peers with one guy on top, Eisenhower, but basically a meeting of his peers. And he says, well, I know how to push those Germans back. He had prepared. He had thought about it. He had thought about it. He had, he had taken Eisenhower's role of assuming the big picture, and he knew what units to go where. He said, you know, and we can drive those Germans back, and we'll have units in Czechoslovakia, and we'll have units going toward Berlin. We'll take the North Sea, the Baltic Sea. We'll come around like this and secure the base of the Alps, and we will form a pincer's movement that will absolutely choke the life out of the German Wehrmacht. They won't have a chance. Well, his peers, Eisenhower, sort of put the kibosh on and said, no, we can't do that because of this, this, this. I did get correspondence back from General Marshall back in Washington, why we can't do that. De Gaulle's not ready to move there. You know, we, we don't have all the pieces in place. Patton was so aggressive as this chess master in these kinds of situations that he had a second plan when they rejected his first. He said, well, with all due respect, General, may I present a second plan to you? <laughs> and he presented a second plan, and pretty soon, and Brian talks about this so well, the limbic system of these guys starts to change, and Patton single-handedly starts to lead the meeting, even though he's in a subordinate position, mm -hmm. and he's starting to get the limbic system, or these emotional, sort of the emotions start to kick in, and, and it's going from can't do can do. We're going to do this. Okay, we, we have the resources. We just need to be smart here. And Patton was able to argue his point, and pretty soon, by the end of the meeting, everybody had orders. Where do you go? So, you know, Eisenhower did not go in focused. He seemed flummoxed, as a matter of fact. But Patton, as a, as a good subordinate, playing that, that role that he could play so well as, hey, uh, there, this is no time for despair. This is time for action decisiveness, and I will help you think through this chess match, both here at the table and getting everybody on board and showing the enthusiasm, the energy, the passion to get that table to commit to doing something, and also in the broader, you know, the chess, chess match against the Wehrmacht to win World War II. The war was over in four months. So that's a good anecdote of the role even a subordinate can play, the important, the key role in changing the whole tone of a meeting. But again, the constant word I've used here is what? Prepare. Prepare. You prepare beforehand. You know what your purposes are. And you have that strong sense and that commitment to the organization or to the group. And um, you see every opportunity to communicate when you're on as this chance then to help your boss, your leader, and achieve the bigger objective, because what it should not be about, and I will have failed to communicate effectively here if, if I were to mislead, this is not about demonstrations of ego. This is not about parading and saying, I'm smarter than others. Um, I really know the situation. The rest of you are idiots. The boss is an idiot. No, this is about, meetings are a place not to demonstrate ego, but to reaffirm your commitment to the goal. And this is what happens when you do that. 
if you reaffirm your commitment to the bigger objective, to the bigger goal, it's, it's in Patton's case, beating the German army so we stop this terrible carnage and the bombing and the kill, killing of so many people. We have to stay focused on that goal. When you stay focused on that, it instills confidence in everybody around you that you could lead if called on. And you have a plan, you're prepared, and people will trust then that you will always have the organization in mind. As opposed to if you go in there and you want to strut your stuff and you're just saying, is that the line that I often use with people is how your mama raises you. I mean, you're, there are two kinds of people. There's the kind of person who walks in the room and they say, here I am, you can't wait to get to know me. What a bore. I mean, we don't like to be around those people for very long, usually. It may be entertaining for part of a time at a party, but it's like they never ask any questions or anything. But the other kind of person is, they walk into the room, they smile, and they say, there you are, there you are, you, 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 I can't wait to get to know you. Let's sit down and talk. Those are the two kinds of people. So when you come to a meeting willing to serve and check that ego at the threshold, come in willing to serve, great things can happen. I'll tell you one final anecdote. I used to enjoy so much watching John Engler at meetings. Now, whether you agree or disagree with his politics, these are techniques that anybody can, can learn and pick up. He had the opportunity after the, uh, I believe it was the 104th Congress back in 1994 was elected, he had the opportunity as a governor, uh, one of the lead Republican governors in the nation at that point, to go in and talk to Republican congressmen in Washington. So here's a governor going to Washington, you'd think this would be intimidating. I watched him prepare. I watched him prepare back in Lansing, and you know he sat down with staff, Mark Murray, you know our former president at Grand Valley. He had a really smart agenda, and it was in his head after he kept talking about it. And then I watched him prepare. We flew to Washington, and I watched him prepare that morning. He's reading the newspapers, and he was a very active reader. He would take a newspaper and like, spread out like this. And, He's circling and he's saying, well, you know, every one of those congressmen will have read this this morning. This is how it's links in. And he's, he's orchestrating all of this in his head. And he gets in that room in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill and talk about a performance, which was just amazing. He said, we cannot leave this room until we have done significant work and know exactly what we're going to do when we leave this room. So he got everybody to agree, first of all, that from a governor's point of view, this is what the states needed. Now, there, there were four or five pieces of legislation that he wanted to see, and he walked into that room with that goal. As the visitor, the guest, <laughs> the guy who was not king of the hill, this little governor out here. So the question was, how is he going to bring these, all these egos <laughs> you know, around, from different states around to his way of thinking? And so he, he started with the the thing that he thought, based on his previous preparation, his conversations with chiefs of staff and that kind of thing, he started with what they could all agree on. And he said, you know what the states need. Let's, let's pass a law that says there will be no more unfunded mandates on the states. That is intrinsically unfair to saddle us states with legislation where we don't have any say over the revenue. And we're stuck having to raise our own funds to... to uh, to find the revenue for a, a law passed in Washington that doesn't take our, our uh, views into account as the state. So let's stop unfunded mandates. Everybody said, well, that, yeah, Governor, that sounds pretty good. Then he had a second proposal. And the second proposal, somebody said, no, I can't go there with you. And so he said, well, what would it take? What do we have to give you so that you'll be in solidarity with us? So we walk out of here now with two bills that your offices are going to begin working on. Well, I do need this. Fine. Can all the rest of you do that? Keep the big goal in mind here. We're about making this country a better country that's more responsive to our people. Okay. Sign them up. Third, you know, third proposal. Oh, there are two people who don't want to go there. You see where I'm going with this. He was able to get four, I think four of the five things that he had set out to do when he first walked in that day. But it was for 
with preparation, clarity, when he had the opportunity to present his ideas, the performance of it. And it was, it was just a great event. I will never forget that. So there's a lot of, there are a lot of lessons about meetings here, but see them as opportunities to support or to change the agenda a little bit if you have to. See them as opportunities to support your, your leader with very important nonverbal and verbal signals. And see them as opportunities where you position yourself, not in an egotistical way, but because you also believe in the mission to position yourself to serve at a higher level should you be called on because you have been establishing the trust and the, the uh, ethos with your colleagues. That's what I wanted to tell you about meetings. So I hope you never glaze over in a meeting again. Okay? <laughs> I'm not making a promise. Okay. <laughs>